to use our 36 by 18 um, by almost 3 inch HDPE plastic mold to create a small table using the Fix Set Fathom product from Total Boat. So this uh, mold is obviously hard and rigid. You can see it's not like the other molds we use, which are the silicone molds, which is pretty much what Crafts Elements is, is, is uh, known for is our extensive line of silicone molds. We do have a limited line of HDP molds, but we really focus on smaller molds, not big, big table molds. So this is one of our bigger molds. We do have this size as well as uh, a wider size in silicone, but they are much more expensive. Silicone molds, uh, inch per inch really, or square inch per square inch, are notably more expensive than these vacuum formed, thermoformed, or rotational molded HDP molds. Now the advantage of this, using an HDP mold like this, is really uh, cost, to be honest. Uh, this mold would be two to three times the price in silicone. Um, this allows us to um, save money, of course, when we're making tables like that. And the HDP molds, especially these perfectly formed ones, they last a really long time. Silicone molds have a limited life. You really, if you're using the proper mold release spray, you should be able to get 20, 30 uses out of a good silicone mold. Um, you should be able to get more out of this. Um, but basically what it means is because this is quite a bit cheaper, your cost per pour uh, and then what you have to pass on to your customers, uh, if you're in the case of if you're doing this as a business, is less when you're using a mold like this. But they also have some disadvantages. Quickly talking about this mold, the HDP molds, whether you get them from us or a formed mold from anyone else, whether it's a vacuum formed, rotational molded, um, these thinner HDP molds are not straight. And I mean like not, they're not crazy wonky, but they're not straight. Like this, if I put a, if I put a level on top of this, you'd see that there's a little bit of a cupping there. These, these walls are not perfectly straight. The bottom is not perfectly straight. But here's the thing. These molds are designed for maker, uh, people who are using them with wood and resin. So they are straight enough. Because if you're using this with wood and resin, you're going to have to pull it out. You're going to have to trim the perimeter. You're going to have to plane it and sand it anyway. So if it's off by a sixteenth of an inch or even a quarter of an inch, it really doesn't matter. Um, there are some molds on the market that are an HDP um, they're thicker HDP, but they're welded design. They're typically are straighter, but the sides, as far as like the material itself, is not as wavy. But the sides are tapered. These sides are straight, but and these welded molds on the market, they go out like this. So you might get straighter, but you have to cut all that off anyway because you've got this taper uh, of of wasted resin or resin and wood. So there's really no advantage to those over these or these over those. You're going to have to trim it anyway, and you're going to have waste anyway. Um, so that's my little prequel into getting uh, into this project. So again, I mentioned earlier that in this series, there is an entire video on finding wood, prepping wood, cutting wood. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to do it in the background and fast forward through it really quick because this part of the segment, this module is really about resin. It's not about molds. It's not about cutting wood. So I'm just going to cut the wood. Then we're going to get to the mixing of that resin so we can put it in this mold and get started. The last 10 or 15 minutes I've prepared that slab, cut the wood, shaved off the bark, gave it a quick sand, and then made sure that the wood was long enough to fit uh, snugly in our mold. Next thing I want to talk about is mold release. In the silicone molds you definitely do need your mold release, a non-silicone based mold release. In these HDP molds however, a mold release is strictly optional. A mold release won't really protect the mold. Um, it, it doesn't have a problem with that, but it will help you demold your item. So in these molds where these walls are, in this case of this mold, these walls are relatively uh, basically 90 degrees. Some of the other molds are marked on there are tapered. 
um, you're going to have to kind of hit this and bang it out from the back. So if you've got the mold release on here, it creates a little bit of a barrier, a little bit of a lubricant to uh, more easily get your piece out of the mold. So again, with the HTP molds, mold release is completely optional. It will help you. It'll, it'll allow you to get the piece out of the mold easier with less stress, less fuss, but it's not required like it is in the silicone molds. So you can use, in the case of the HDP molds, you can use a non-silicone release like this, or you can use a silicone-based release. Silicone-based release like CRC or Stoner or whatever, um, that's a silicone spray. You can use that because this mold is not silicone, so it doesn't really matter. You don't, you wanna use a silicone-based release, a silicone spray on a silicone mold. There's an entire video, like everything else, on that topic on mold releases in this series. I'm gonna put my PPE on, I'm gonna give this a spray, let's go. All right, I'm gonna grab my wood that we pre-cut, put it in the mold. Another thing to mention about these HDP molds compared to um, our silicone molds is that with these HDP molds that are vacuum formed, uh, i.e. they were drawn out of a, a single sheet with a vacuum, they, they heat up the sheet, goes over a master mold, the, to the tooling, um, and forms over and then they draw, and then they cool down, and they come off, or in this case, is these molds, which are rotational molded. HDP uh, molds are not gonna have a perfect 90 degree sharp corner or edge. You can see probably in the video um, that these, and whether it's you're, whether you're buying HDP molds from us or someone else, but the formed ones like this that are one piece do not have 90 degree perfect edges. So your wood's always gonna sit, you know, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch away from that edge. Uh, just because of the round radius. You could certainly account for that. You could pre-radius this wood um, with a router bit to fit more snugly in the mold if you wanted to go through that effort. To me, it doesn't really matter. One, because I'm doing this as a demonstration, and two, because either way, you're going to uh, trim the perimeter and plane it anyway. So I'm not really sure it's worth the extra effort. If, you, if you're really concerned about the additional wasted epoxy, either use a silicone mold, which we can get a nice 90 degree perfect edge on, uh, or just pre router the edges. Okay, so we've got our pieces in the mold. Let's get our measuring tape and we'll use our formula. What's interesting here is that this river is essentially the same uh, width. It's just going kind of on an angle. So it's gonna make measuring it really, really easy. You've got five and a half, five, five and a half, four and three quarters, five. So you know what, let's do five and a half. So you got five and a half. Uh, the mold should be 36 and a half. Yep, 36 and a half. And now how, how deep do we want to do this pour? Uh, this mold is three inches, but our slab here is barely, it's just under two, it's one and seven eighths. Um, so we'll probably end up doing that one and seven eighths. Well, we'll call it two inches and we won't add the 10% adjustment factor. So we've got 401 uh, cubic inches, which is 5.5 36, times 36 and a half times two divided by 1.8, and we're gonna get 223 um, ounces. So we need 223 ounces, uh, give or take, to fill this up. And that is where the Deep Pour uh, Thick Set Fathom product is gonna come in. It's going to do these two inch pours like a dream. Uh, it's gonna mix up really well. It's gonna degas itself really well, and it will take pigment. So I'm gonna shift this out of the way, and we're going to measure up 223 ounces of product. I misplaced all my large buckets, so we're gonna use two of these guys to get that total of approximately 223 ounces of, of material. So basically, I'm gonna roughly get 120 ounces out of each of these. Now, the thick set Fathom product is a two to one ratio, which means uh, if I wanna get 120, we're gonna divide that by three, and you're gonna essentially end up with 40 ounces per part. So you're gonna get 40 ounces of the hardener in, in each of these buckets, and then you're gonna get 80 ounces of the resin in each of these buckets to basically get two, uh, 120 ounce, uh, roughly 240 ounces of material. Right. Now, luckily with the higher volume, thinner product, we don't have to mix it by hand. You certainly could. Um, but in this case, I'm going to use one of my mixing attachments. Um, I find the best thing to use is either the swirled mixer here. Um, you can also get a paint mixer from Amazon. They're disposable and they're cheap. They're like $15 each and you just attach them to your power drill. Now you're not in a rush, do not just floor it, otherwise you're gonna have resin shoot everywhere. Start slow and work up to speed. And just like our hand mixing method, 
We want to mix this for about three minutes or until uh, everything's set where you don't see all these little ribbons and you can see like the swirls and stuff. You don't want that. If you see that, that means your resin's not set. You want basically clear resin. The bubbles are okay, um, but you, you, want, uh, you want to avoid like the, the murky, swirly kind of uh, texture inside there right now. You can see it's, really, it's, it's going away quickly. We've got some swirls left, but you can see the end of the mixer now really clearly. And just make sure you get along the bottom and the edges too. If you're not, um, if you're not using a reused bucket, you don't have a, a risk of knocking any old resin in there, so you're okay to hit the edges. And you can see the advantage of this mixer is you're not introducing a lot of water. I'm uh, sorry, you're not introducing a lot of air. So you can see that there's some bubbles, but it's not really a big deal. This thin product, as I have said multiple times in this video, um, is going to lose that, uh, that air really, really quickly um, within the mold once you've, once you've poured it. It doesn't have to be 100% purely mixed at this point because remember, we still have to add our pigment and mix it again, so we're going to end up mixing it a second time. However, I just had a, uh, an idea that because we've already got these separated, we should do like a fire and ice table, but essentially where you have two colors uh, poured per side and they come together in the middle and they kind of mix to create another color. So we end up with like a, a tri-colored table. So I'm going to pick two different pigments kind of representing fire and ice and mix them together and see what we get. All right, we could take this mixer out and wipe it off, but I'm going to just get a little bit of the resin off and it's going to be pigmented resin, but it's going to be so insignificant that I'm just going to use it in the other bucket and you're not even going to be able to tell. All right, we're about ready to pour our epoxy resin in here, but first I want to weigh the wood down. Like I used uh, hand weights before, but in the case of this bigger material uh, and the bigger amount of resin that's going to be under there, I'm going to actually clamp this down. And the trick I use is actually use HDPE blocks and a bar and then my clamps. I'm going to show you what I mean. So I have a bunch of spare HDPE plastic, and you know by the, the makeup of this mold that uh, resin really doesn't stick to HDPE, so it's, it's really a, an ideal uh, product to use for this application. Piece of wood there above the HDPE, and then I can take my clamps. Tighten them both at the same time. Go on opposing edges here. I'm gonna bring our resin up here. Again, this is the Total Boat Thick Set Fathom product, which is good for two inch pours. Um, what I've actually seen some people do is because this product is so thin, and whether it's this product or another deep pour product, is they'll go ahead and put uh, a piece in the middle here uh, temporarily um, to prevent the colors from mixing and then. Uh, the next day or maybe in a few hours, depending on how it fast sets, we'll take that piece out. And I'm talking about like a little piece of plastic, maybe a piece of wood, just to keep the, the resin from mixing. Um, that's certainly a technique you can do and something you can do if you're mixing two different colors like this. I'm not going to bother, simply because this is a demonstration video and I want to see how this turns out. Uh, it's going to end up with three different colors once these actually mix. Let's get to it. And remember that in this case, it doesn't really matter if you overfill this because this is a wooden resin project where we're going to have to plane down, i.e. level the entire thing uh, with our planer, slab level, or CNC to get the entire thing at level. And you can see that estimate uh, for the calculation was pretty good. Uh, we only have a little bit of material left. So what's left now is just to let it set. Like our charcuterie board, we're going to come back uh, probably in this case the next day, swirl this material up. We want to swirl it up because at this point it looks pretty, but a lot of that pigment is going to uh, set and, and kind of sink down to the bottom overnight, which is not what we want to have. And we want to keep it looking kind of swirly and, and cool. We'll probably swirl the, the middle along. And then uh, in about three days, uh, three to four days, we'll come back, we'll demold it, and then we can level it and go from there. Hey folks, we're back the next day since we poured this table. This is the part of the video where I was going to show you how to swirl up the uh, resin because in this case of the 
uh, thick set fathom resin, it is still uh, a liquid. It's not gelled up, it's definitely not solid. So we could de definitely stir it up and get the pigment uh, back into the resin more. However, I'm not gonna do that, and I'm gonna tell you why here. When I mix these two colors, I did the, the green blue or whatever, and the, that orange, that fire orange. Um, the blue has gone underneath more or less the orange, but then broken through the orange and then like this cool, I don't know what to call it, like a crack in the earth. And it's turned the orange more of a burnt orange, like a copper color, but with this really nice blue accent line. And I, I like it. I, I don't want to change it. I'm not going to go and mess with something that happened naturally here. Now, why did the blue go underneath and the orange stay on top? I honestly can't answer that. It might be something to do with the density of the pigment uh, with the higher density product sinking to the bottom. I'm not exactly sure, but if we wanted to get that true, you know, separation effect where you have the blue here and the orange here, as I alluded earlier in this video, putting a separator in there temporarily and then taking it out the next day. Uh, so the most of the resin's already kind of partially set and it's not gonna mix as much. That would have solved the problem. However, I'm happy with how it's turned out. So we're just gonna leave it. This is a three inch mold. Our wood was about two inches high. We're gonna end up with a one and three quarter inch thick piece once we actually cast, or once we actually mill this down and level it out. So I'm gonna show you the demolding process here with these, it is certainly not as easy as our silicone molds. And whether you're using um, an HDPE mold from us or an HDPE mold from someone else, uh, they are definitely not as easy as the silicone molds, but they are available in bigger sizes. You wanna start uh, either by hand, pulling it apart, or with a, a rubber mallet, just lightly going around the entire perimeter. And what we're doing is we're essentially breaking the bond between the, the um, the epoxy and the HDPE mold. You don't want to hit this, like, you don't want to hit it too hard, especially in the corners, because you do not want to break the corners. Um, but you do want to go all the way around and loosen it up, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to flip this thing. And if it doesn't come out, we'll tap it along the back. And it came out, so there you go. There's our mold, which is of course reusable again, and our tabletop. And it's funny because you know we did use that two color pour, hoping to keep those two colors separate on the top. We ended up with blue sinking to the bottom, and then that uh, vibrant orange, which turned into a copper when it mixed with blue, to the top. So it's kind of it's kind of funky. Now this, just like you would with a planer, we're gonna actually need to level both sides. Which side do you choose to do at once? I'm not sure it really matters. I'm gonna arbitrarily choose this one. But the key is that you wanna actually, uh, you know, level your piece, whether you're using your planer or your CNC machine or your slab leveler, before you actually trim it up. Because if you start trimming and your, your bottom, your top's not flat or level, you might end up trimming a side or whatever on an angle. So it's really important that you level your piece before you actually do your trimming and of course getting to that final sanding stage. So I'm gonna line this up here. I'm gonna go over and grab our uh, series of clamps. Definitely the time that I'd want to have the, the vacuum option for the table, but if you're not doing a lot of slab leveling with your CNC, probably unnecessary. As you can see, this works just as well. We're going to line up our bit and we're going to measure out this so we can go over to our computer and figure out our programming. All right, so our piece is 18 and a half by 36 and a half. So we're going to give it a little bit of extra room there. Uh, we want the actual bit to go a little bit past the extents, uh, but not too much as to hit these uh, the clamps that we have here. Now our height really doesn't matter right now, but it's two inches, but we actually want to get it down to the minimum level, right? So we need to figure out what the minimum level is, and that's the amount of depth we're gonna have to determine to take off in our program. So, you know, the highest level here is about two and an eighth, and that's two there, but really where that resin is, we've got one and three quarters, we'll probably wanna go a little bit below that. So in our program, we're gonna say, okay, we've got a two and an eight inch thick slab or two and eight inch two and an eighth inch thick piece of material. And we wanna go down to a little less than an inch and three quarters. Let's go. All right, in Vectric, which is a popular CNC software, I'm gonna set our width as 19 and a half. And our height, I think, what did I say, it was gonna be 38 or 37? 
Let's call it, uh, let's call it 38. Our thickness of the material is the thickest it actually is right now, which I believe was uh, two and uh, an eighth. All right, so we've got our material there. What we're gonna do is we're gonna just make a simple slab leveling program by creating a, um, an equal sized rectangle. Uh, we're gonna choose our end mill. So the end mill is the actual router bit or the spindle bit, the CNC bit. That is actually attached to our spindle and that's programmed in our tool database. So I don't have it here and here, so I'm actually just gonna add it really, really quickly uh, to specify what the, um, what the size is. It is an inch and a quarter carbide tip bit from Amana. And we're just setting our path depth as uh, an eighth of an inch. Step over at 50%. And we're gonna set the speed at 7,500 RPM. And the feed rate uh, of 250 inches per minute. Um, we want to go down half an inch exactly, right? So the cut depth is half an inch. We're gonna have our spoil board bit selected. We're gonna hit calculate, and it's gonna generate the program automatically that we'll be able to preview here, as you can see, as the spoil board bit goes, uh, or the slab leveling bit, spoil board bit goes around and around and around, starts in the center, and it's gonna do multiple passes here to level out that slab, and then we can do the same thing over and over. The key thing is that we have specified the height of that slab at two and an eighth, so you want to make sure that when we set up our bit over there that we've got this right on top at that two and an eighth the highest level and then set that as our origin or our starting position so let's save this program to our usb stick we'll bring it over to the cnc machine and we'll run it back at the cnc machine we've got our usb drive installed we're going to select that file um, that we created it's going to preview it there on the screen now we're going to install the correct bit that we've set in our program so i'm going to take off this guy. Now we have to set our origin, which basically means the XY start position being here and the depth. We've already determined that this corner is pretty much the highest out of the entire slab, and that's that that's that two and a quarter inch, or sorry, two and an eighth inch level we were discussing over when we were programming, uh, setting up our software. So we're just going to let bring that bit over, and you're going to do the center of the bit. Uh, because it's the center of the spindle that's the origin, not the edge of the bit. So that's roughly center. Uh, if we were actually doing like a precise CNC project, we want to be a little more careful, but we've got a little bit of room to play with here. And then we're going to lower it just so that bit grazes the top, and then we're going to set that as the Z0, or the Z origin. So clear Z. That sets it as the top, essentially, saying that, okay, now we're at the very top of the material, and then we're gonna set X, Y to zero, and you can see now zero, zero, zero. X is zero, Y is zero, zero, zero. That means this is our origin point. We're then going to bring this back up, attach our vacuum hose, or we've got our vacuum hose down, we're gonna turn on our vacuum system, and we're gonna start the program. It's really that easy. It is time to sand our 36 by 18 inch small tabletop or giant security board, depending on what you want to use it for. This has already been leveled with our CNC machine and a slab leveling or spoil board bit. And we are now having to sand it. So because we have these, you know, obvious machine marks from the bit, we definitely want to start with a lower grit 
40, 60, 80. However, I'm going to cheat. Well, I don't want to say cheat. I'm going to be efficient with my time because I'm all about efficiency. Most of the time, this is a sander I use. It is a simple DeWalt random orbit palm sander, five inch discs. It's like a hundred dollar sander, right? And I have it hooked to my vacuum system. But I do have the luxury of having one of these Gem Industries big 11 inch sanders. And that will literally cut the work in like half, possibly 25% of the work by using the sander simply because we have that much more surface area. So sanding goes quicker. One thing to mention about these, uh, these are obviously an expensive item. They're $600 or $700 for the unit. Comes with a shroud that will attach to your vacuum system. And they also use slightly different paper. They use the 11 inch discs. But these are rated in microns, not grit levels. So in the other sandpaper, which you know was like a 40 grit to like a 2000 grit, with the higher grit number being a finer, you know, smoother finish, the lower grit number in these is the finer, smoother finish because when measuring in microns, the lower the micron number, the finer it is. Makes sense, right? It's a smaller part particle. So I've got 120 micron paper, which is probably like, maybe like an 80 to 100 grit equivalent. Um, and I'm gonna put that on our sander, we're gonna get to work. Get that on the pad, and you can see that the way that this works, it's a random orbit uh, design. So you're gonna get that nice finish there, a random finish, instead of just constant swirl marks, which is really good for these sanders. And the cool thing is the weight of these things is substantial, 20 pounds. Uh, so it's going to automatically put pressure on this piece so I don't have to press on it to sand it. It's going to just naturally uh, have downward force because of its weight. Alright, so that first layer of sanding is done with the uh, 11 inch sander and as you can see it just uh, took off all those machining marks. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to router the sides of this. I could have done that in advance but I wanted to make sure we had a super level surface and I didn't want those machining marks to kind of affect the way that the router was sitting. So I'm going to go ahead and router the edges, round off the edges. I could use a handheld router. Okay, maybe not this one, but this is like a trim router. I could have maybe used this, but I have a bigger handheld router as well. I got to use the handheld router with the router bit, but because this is a small enough table, I'm just gonna flip it upside down and go to my router table and router it that way. Now, if you recall from earlier in the video, we are going to be using the Rubio Monocoat on this table. Um, and because of that, we want to make sure that this wood doesn't get sanded past, Rubio says 150 grit. I can typically go up to 220 grit and, and do go up to 220 grit. But that's specific to the wood, right? If we wanted to make this resin pop a little bit more, make it a little clearer, we can just sand this part, just the resin part, uh, independently of the wood. So we'll go up to 150 grit on the wood and then we'll probably go up to like a thousand grit on the resin and then we'll apply this stuff because this stuff remember isn't really doing much to the resin. It's really uh, it doesn't getting it's not getting absorbed into plastic it's getting absorbed into the wood. So we want to make sure those grains are open enough to receive the oil like this. So I'm going to switch to my hand sander uh, because I've got uh, more uh, sanding discs available for that that I can go. I'm also going to do the sides of the table and I'm not going to bother with the underside of this because, um, well, you've got some excess resin here and stuff. It's, it has been leveled, but it's a table, so no one's gonna see underneath it. 
Uh, it's certainly up to you if you want to finish the underside of your table. Some people just finish them very basically and just throw some oil on them. I don't think it's necessary, especially in this case, because this is for a demonstration. Uh, I just don't need to put that much work into it. So I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, sanding this to probably 220 and then just sanding this up to close to 1,000. sand the entire thing including the sides and I'm going to go ahead and water pop the green now. Uh, you could spray water on or you could use a somewhat wet rag and really what you want to do is just get the, the wood grain wet enough to pop up. Um, so anyway we're popping the grain here. We're going to hit it again with 220 to smooth out the wood and the resin and then I'm going to go over the resin to close to a thousand just to get it really clear because you can see as it's wet here it's starting to show really nice but it's still a little bit murky. Um, it's not the clarity that I want, but as I sand that higher, and then after we finish it with the Ruby Monaco, it'll be much clearer. So I've moved our tabletop after sanding uh, to a different part of the shop that is less sandy and dusty and dirty. I've got our Ruby Monaco uh, oil plus 2C, and it is in a pure color, which means it's not tinted at all. They do offer this product in various tints, um, but in most cases, if you're a woodworker, you want the wood and the resin to shine through and see through as you built it, not to tint the entire thing, right? Now, the, the one thing to note about this is you've got your main part, but you've also got your hardener or your accelerator, um, which is going to allow you to actually get this tabletop, you know, fully done in a day uh, or a day and a half of setting and drying versus a couple of weeks. If you don't add the accelerator to this, it will still dry, but it takes like one to two weeks. So it's kind of a no-brainer. You wanna use the accelerator. And to do that, you need to mix a three to one ratio. So three parts of the main component and one part of the accelerator. And as I said earlier, like this is a really small container, This is, but it's very expensive. This stuff is very costly, but it goes a long way. Like this would probably do a small room if you were doing a uh, floor. Um, but just a very a small amount of this is going to be required for this table. It's not like an oil finish, uh, a typical oil finish that gets in and absorbs a lot. It's going to absorb a little, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be, you know, sucked up by the wood to the point where you're just going to need to make more of it. And I'm going to show you just what I mean. So I'm going to go ahead and measure out a rough three to, or not a rough, an actual three to one ratio. So I'm going to do 10 mil of the accelerator. And you obviously want to make sure you're careful not to spill any of this on the tabletop in advance. So probably should have done this over on the workbench, but I'm confident I'm not going to spill any. And to be honest, this much is probably way too much. Like this much would do a much larger tabletop than this. So to be honest, we're probably end up going to waste some of this product here. And the, the cool thing is, is if you do mess this stuff up in terms of mixing it, uh, you don't put enough of the accelerator in, it's still going to dry. It's just going to take longer. It's not like epoxy resin where it's not ever going to set uh, if you mix up your ratios. So that's one thing to consider. But obviously, you know, you want to be careful when you're measuring this stuff out um, because there's no point in waiting longer to get a project done than you need to. All right, thoroughly mixed. So we're ready to apply this and I typically use a squeegee-like scraper here. It is a plastic HDPE plastic scraper, easy to wash off after. There's also rubber and silicone scrapers or, or spatulas you can use. Um, so we're going to do that and rub all that in there. It is a thick material so it's really handy to do that. You can use this around the edges too but you also want to use your hands just to make sure you, and a glove, 
to make sure you get uh, full coverage everywhere. And the thing to mention about this is this material, once you've added the accelerator, will create, it, create a molecular bond with that wood in three to five minutes. So anytime after five minutes, you could technically start removing the oil, but you don't wanna be any longer than 15 minutes. So typically between the 10 and 15 minute mark after you've applied this is when you wanna start buffing it off and you really can't buff too much of it off. You can, you can leave too much on. So you don't wanna be concerned about taking too much off because the, the initial bond is really done within five minutes. So anything else that's coming off is excess anyway. And you do not wanna leave that on there because if you, if you leave too much of it on there, the next day is gonna look terrible. It'll flake off and it'll be really kind of mucky looking. Uh, you wanna make sure that you buff a significant amount of that off. So I'm going to go ahead and look at the time now. It's 1.11 p.m. And I probably, like I said, made too much, but I'm gonna go ahead anyway and put roughly half of that on there. And then start squeegeeing it in. And you can see that resin just really pop. Uh, I sanded that resin to about a thousand grit, and obviously we sanded the wood. I think I sanded it to 220 grit. Um, again, Rubio Monaco uh, indicates you don't really wanna sand past 150 grit because you start to end up closing up the pores of the wood. But when I've ever, whenever I've done these tables, I don't do a lot of them, but whenever I do do them, I usually sand the wood to 220 grit and I don't have a problem with it. But I'm also not convinced if I only sanded it to 150 or maybe even 180 grit that it would look or feel any different. So the resin would look different if I only sanded it to 150 or 200 or 220 grit, but I don't think the actual wood component of this table would look any different. So I'm gonna go around the edges now. Just rub it in like that. And you can see I'm actually not gonna need any more of that material. So I've got pretty much half of what I made left over. So a little does go a long way. I cannot understate that with this stuff. And that applies to all hard waxes in general, hard oil wax finishes, whether it's Rubia Monocoat or Osmo Oil or Odie's Oil. They are a thicker product. They're not, they're not like water thin like mineral oil where they're gonna get absorbed really, really quickly and, and uh, get really deep into the wood, but they are gonna be absorbed, obviously, which is why they indicate to not sand past 150. But again, when we were talking about this earlier in the video, but the real advantage to these hard wax finishes is that you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the ease of application. Uh, really, this is, you know, a monkey could do this. Um, the ease of application of an oil finish, like a natural oil finish, uh, which is then gonna wipe off, but you get the resilience of a varnish, which is gonna create a, a thin but hard sh wax shell. Hence the hard wax oil finish classification of these. And that's why so many woodworkers are using these products and tables these days, because it's just such an awesome product. I use this product, Rubia Monaco uh, in the pure color on my walnut and resin office desk that I built for myself at home uh, three, two or three years ago. And it still looks like it did on day one, uh, other than the edge of the desk, because my kids are always banging chairs into it. So it's kind of dented, but the surface looks really good. All right, so we've got enough material on there. We're gonna wait 10 minutes. We're gonna come back and buff all that off. All right, it's now 1.24 p.m. So that time has passed that we need to actually wipe all this off. And you just wanna get a lint-free cloth, uh, like a terry cloth or rag or whatever, key being lint-free, you don't wanna leave anything in the finish. Just do a quick wipe off and then you can start uh, actually doing like a real nice buff on it. And you can actually use, um, you can either do this with your hand in a cloth or you can actually use like a power buffer. Just keep in mind that like all oil finishes, you want to safely dispose of these cloths. They're not really usable, especially this stuff because you're gonna end up with that hard wax finish in the cloth. So it's not really something you can easily wash out. So you're gonna dispose of this cloth in a safe way because these oil finishes can combust in the garbage, right? So don't want that. You don't want your shop or your house burning down. So again, I can keep doing it like that or I can grab a portable buffer.
The other thing you want to do is similar to like doing a flood coat, you can have some of this material go underneath the, the table, especially when it's raised like that. So you want to go around, just make sure you get a couple of inches under uh, to flatten any oil that's kind of seeped under there and cause a drip mark because once it does harden, it's kind of nasty to get off. Um, so yeah, just go around the table really quickly or your board or whatever you're making with this stuff. So now that we've buffed all this off, we have to wait uh, 24 to 36 hours before we actually consider it done. So basically 24 to 36 hours is when it can be handled. Uh, if you're comparing it to resin, that would be like your tech free or your demold time. So uh, basically tomorrow by this time, we'll be able to actually attach legs to it and lightly use it. Uh, but Rubio Monocoat, uh, Rubio rather, says that this product uh, is basically 80% cured, like full hardness in two days, so 48 hours, and is fully cured within five days. So it's actually very much like resin. Um, you get the, you can handle it, you know, within a day, day and a half, uh, but it's not fully cured to its maximum hardness for five days.